that's not bad considering I had on the wrong glasses. <laughs> well, good morning. You've had announcements up in front of you. Um, confirmation class for the students who are involved in confirmation class will resume at the end of August, and then we'll go three weeks on into September to finish up. Uh, we have their confirmation Bibles ordered. They'll have those for their next meeting um, for confirmation. So, and at that one, we're taking a lot greater in-depth look at Scripture and what's contained there and how to find what you need to find when you pick up a Bible. Um, and yes, you can do it with your telephone. We all know that now, don't we? Um, however, it's good to know how to use some of the basic tools that are available in the text as well. Um, as I said, Ron, uh, Becky Prasick has a birthday coming this week. There are a couple others, and I have them here. I will have to find them. You notice I wrote you an article. If you haven't gotten the newsletter yet, it is available. Um, I wrote an article about the saints that we celebrate in the Lutheran Church. Um, we don't often celebrate the Saints' Day unless it actually falls on a Sunday. Uh, however, there are a number of saints that we remember. Lawrence the Deacon Martyr, 258. Florence Nightingale, that one you might know. Claire, and, and they're considering Clara Maz, our considered renewers of society. Maximilian Kolb and Kaj Monk, who were martyrs in World War II. Um, Bernard, the Abbot of Clairvaux, 1152. Bartholomew, the Apostle, Augustine, in 430. And Moses the Black, monk and martyr, about 400. So let's not drop the idea that the Lutheran Church has gotten rid of all the saints. We have them. Uh, but we remember them in a different way. We don't use them as a vehicle for prayer very generally. Um, instead, we depend on Christ as the sole mediator between heaven and God and us, um, where other churches draw on the saints and sometimes pray to the saints. Um, I don't think there's any harm in doing that, but scripture is pretty clear that there's one mediator and that that's Christ. Um, when we were selling my parents' house up in Michigan, my sister-in-law brought her statue of Joseph and buried it upside down in the yard. I had never heard of that before. Um, it's to hasten the sale of the home. I don't know if it worked the house sold, but I don't know if it made it any faster or not. So uh, there, there are these approaches to the saints and what they can accomplish. I mean, St. Christopher has been a common saint to, to journey with people, or people have a sense of his journey with them in life. Um, so let's not forget the saints of the Lutheran Church. Uh, they weren't Lutheran, obviously, if it's 400, they weren't Lutheran. Um, that didn't, Lutheranism didn't really take hold until about 1540. So, uh, well, it started in 1517, they wrote the Confirmation in 1529, the Book of Concord was in the 50, 1540s. So, it was the Church of Reform for most of that time, and not named the Lutheran Church. So I had to really hunt to find a picture of saints that we could put on our newsletter that didn't have a copyright issue. And even at that, we have to write now no copyright infringement intended because we're not making any money off of this. Um, so just keep that in mind, folks. And we're going to continue now with the order for confession and forgiveness on page 94. And I'm going to put on the right glasses so I can play music. We have a request from some members of the congregation. Pastor Kim, would you please sit here? What? Oh, oh yeah, my arthritic knees love this weather. <laughs> yes, sir. Would all of you wish to come oh. Hello. 
there's not much there, so just don't pull in. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. <laughs>
here ends the reading from the Psalms. A reading from the Epistle to the Ephesians. For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Here ends the epistle. side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test Philip, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. About five thousand, I'm sorry, I just bounced off. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. When Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When, the, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Holy Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We continue now with hymn 555, if you're using your hymnal.
couple really important stories in this gospel today. One having to do with the feeding of the masses who have come to Jesus to seek his assistance. Another is a story about the disciples and they're getting caught on Galilee in a bad windstorm and of Christ coming through the, across the water to them. In another gospel, we have Peter stepping out of the boat to go to Christ. Um, the story in John is a little bit different, and that's okay. John wrote much, much later. Already knew the whole picture of the story from previous writers, probably, since he wrote at the very end of that first century or on into the beginning of the first century uh, of Christ, or after Christ's death. I was always amazed as a child because up, up in the front of the church where I grew up, um, off to the right of the altar, um, and, and not on the footpiece of the altar, not on the, the floor level of the altar, but up on the wall which was closer to the congregation, was a picture of Peter and Jesus in the water. And of course it wasn't of the successful moments of Peter walking on the water. You all know what it was about. It was about Peter losing faith and doubting whether or not he could actually do what Christ had commanded him to do and had fallen through. Yes, there's that long joke about the three clergy people, one Jewish, one Catholic, and one Protestant, you know, and they don't tell the Protestant pastor where the rocks are in the water, but that's a whole other story. The people, including his disciples, were hungry for what Christ had to bring to them. Their lives had been filled with such upheaval, such difficulty, such poverty, such an experience of dishonesty on the part of the people they were called to trust the most in the temple, And when the Romans came in, things got even worse. 
they were looking and hungry not just to be fed that meal that Christ created out of a few loaves and fishes, but they were hungering to be fed by the truth of God's word, by the power of God's love for their lives. And that's why they continually sought after Christ no matter where he went around Galilee. The crowds followed. If one group was left on the other side, somehow word got around that he was there and he would be crowded again with more people than it seemed possible to help. We know by the story of the feeding of these 5,000 plus, it wasn't just 5,000, it was more than 5,000. We know by this story that Christ had a deep and abiding compassion for the current well-being of God's children. That he wanted to be sure that they had adequate food. He wanted also to make sure that his disciples had adequate food. I don't know, how do you eat a bushel of bread and fish? It sounds like a big family event to me. But that's the symbolism of this gospel about the provision for every one of the disciples. And by the way, who was included in this group? Judas. Judas was included in this provision. It's important for us to be able to acknowledge that, that Christ cares not only for those who he knows love him, but even for those he knows do not particularly love him, but love other things of the world more. You might be aware that I served in the Merchant Marine for a couple of summers on the Great Lakes. I was trying, racking my head this morning to remember, uh, there were two boats I was on. And we, yes, we did call them boats. They were 300 feet long. And they were train ferries. And I worked on the Badger and the Spartan. What? Maybe. I, I know I started out on the Spartan and moved. There are lots of stories about feeding on that, and one of the reasons I cannot eat oatmeal to this day <coughs> is because I had the night watch breakfast when all of the people would come back from Milwaukee or Manitowoc or Kiwani onto the boat. All of the crew would come on, and they would often not be in real good condition. They went and found bars to drink in. But my work was to have that what we call the drunkard's lunch ready. And I can, can't tell you how many nights out on Lake Michigan I watched that oatmeal slop back and forth on that hot table. I just, I, it was years before I could even consider the possibility of allowing oatmeal to pass my lips. Um, it's still difficult for me. But I understand about the, the water I understand about the roughness of Galilee. Lake Michigan is a shallow lake too. And when the wind comes up out of a certain direction, primarily in the north from the upper peninsula driving south down Lake Michigan, the waves become massive. And that's what was going on with the disciples. I suspect the wind had come off the end of, the, of Galilee where the Jordan River flows into Galilee and they had really built up to the point where it was very difficult to get across. I can tell you stories of going down below the train decks to my cabin. It wasn't much of a cabin, but it's where I got to sleep. Um, I always wondered who got out first if the boat decided to go down. And I didn't think it was any of us who had cabins below the train deck. I kind of thought probably we were the lost because we'd be the last to get out. But there are stories of those car ferries shipping water over the rear deck. There, there was a great um, plate of metal that, came, that lifted, the trains went in, and then this giant plate of metal came down probably 20 feet high at the back of the boat. And there were some times when they had waves washing over onto the train deck. The disciples were truly frightened. This was, for them, beyond anything they thought they 
could deal with. And a couple of them were fishermen. But they were not fishermen who went out in the middle of Galilee. They were fishermen who, fought, who, who fished with nets along the shore. They weren't deep water fishermen. Now, growing up, we all learned how to fish on the break wall that went out into Lake Michigan. But we didn't, I never was comfortable going out into a boat where the water was 100 feet deep. Ever comfortable with that. The disciples were terrorized by what was happening. It speaks to the situation and circumstance of people. We are terrorized by the possibilities in life. Where do we turn for help? Where do we go to get what we need? How do we handle that? The disciples had no idea of how they might weather this storm. And it's not the first story that we have about Jesus calming the waves and stopping the wind. In this one, it's more miraculous. The disciples, all of a sudden, are where they are supposed to be. It's as if their boat has been teleported across the water to the shore they were seeking. I think there's a great lesson in that. When we turn to Christ, which the disciples ended up doing, they found their way to the shore where they were supposed to be. And the same thing is true for you and me. When we turn to Christ by the guidance of Christ's Spirit, we too will end up at the place that we have sought to go. It doesn't mean that the water won't be rough and difficult. It doesn't mean that we won't hunger sometimes for more than we think we're receiving. All of that in all of that, in which we feel that way, we have one who is journeying in with and around us all of the time. Not, not, just, not just when it gets bad, but every day. Every day, all of the time. And that's the promise Christ makes. He promises to always be with those who love him. He did this with his disciples. He promised to always be with them. And he didn't fail them. He came to them even in the midst of the storm where he was not in the boat with them because he had been on the mountainside setting some time aside for prayer. And yet when he knew the need of the disciples, he was there with them. Sometimes you and I, I think, feel like Christ isn't always with us. You know, you all prayed, the Bible study prayed that the results of the biopsies that the doctor had done on me would all come back clear. Believe me, I prayed too. But the good news in all of this is that it doesn't have to be operated on right away. It's not virulent and spreading. That's the good news. The other stuff I didn't want to have to deal with, but I'm going to have to deal with. I suspect there are some of us here who've been in that circumstance. There are things we have to do we just don't want to have to deal with in our life. But I am confident I'll be well cared for. That in this storm in my life, Christ is going to be there. And I hope that, that you know that about the storms of your lives, too. That Christ is there, as he has promised to be. Always there, never away, even when we feel like maybe he's decided to have lunch in Egypt, Or he's taking a break in Cabo. Or, you know, he's always there. Always there for each one of us. And for all of us, this community. The disciples had to learn. If, if, there's, if, if there's anything we're learning at the end of the book of Romans, it is about Paul's drive to fulfill his promise to take care of the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the ones who have lost their job by following Christ, who may have worked in some 
way around the temple or in the temple but because they believe in Jesus they now no longer have work and Paul made a promise to Peter that he would take an offering and bring it back to support the poor in Jerusalem that's how Christ works he revealed himself to Paul and gave Paul a driving force in his life not only to proclaim Christ as the Lord and Savior, but to do the work that Christ calls everyone to do. And so his, his journey, before he was going to go to Spain, his journey, the most important journey right now for Paul at the end of Romans, is to get on the way to go back to Jerusalem. And though Paul wants to go to Spain, he never makes it. That's not God's plan for Paul's life. That's Paul's plan for God's life, or for Paul's life. Did you ever do that? Have God take you someplace you didn't plan on going? You bet. Happens to all of us. In our lives, we must always be ready. It's like the disciples. You know, Jesus said, go get in the boat and go over the others. I'm going to go pray. The disciples did it not expecting to have to be separated from Christ to get on Galilee and cross over. But that's what they had to do at that time. And Christ kept his promise to be with them. When things got really bad, Christ came. And he took care of them and lost no one. Remember in the passages about uh, just before the resurrection, Jesus in his prayer says, I haven't lost any of those you've given me. That's you and me. Wow. He's not lost any of us. That's amazing and extraordinary and holy. And that's why we need Christ. We need the Spirit's presence to make sure that we always continue our search for God's glory and grace for our lives and living together in the church, in the community, and in our individual lives. Ever been hungry? Probably. My Jesse says he's hungry if dinner is an half hour late. And I say, no, you're not. You can't possibly be that hungry. Well, he's 15, he's got a big frame, and it's difficult for him to be hungry. It's difficult for you and me too. When we are hungering for Christ and we think Christ isn't with us, we get hungrier still. The good news is that Christ's presence is with us. And he won't desert us. He won't leave us alone. He won't allow us to continue to hunger and thirst for God's grace and glory forever. And the time will come when Christ meets us in the storm and makes sure we get to where we're going. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Oh, sure, he's getting up. <laughs> With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy, Holy Catholic, Catholic Church, the, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray now for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for the church, and for all of God's creation. Gracious Lord, you have empowered and inspired people to write your holy word down so that we might be led in many different ways out of the same texts, helping us to understand in the moment of our need, whether it is to share joy or sorrow or struggle and difficulty with illness, you are with us. And we give you thanks for that, for sending your Son, who is our Lord and Savior, and for his gift of the Holy Spirit to us, that we might always turn to you in times of need and in times of joy and celebration to give you thanks and praise for being our Father in heaven creating us a strong faith. Let the joy of that faith fill our lives every day. And give us confidence in your promise to always be with us. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious Lord, we pray for Joanna and Kelly as they await their insurance company's decision for dealing with the storm damage at their house from a couple of weeks ago. We pray that the decision will be to replace the fence and remove the tree. And keep Kelly and Joanna and patients safe in your care while all of this continues to unfold in the midst of stormy weather and take good care of their pets as well. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious Lord, we pray for all of the teachers. Kelly is a teacher. Uh, Christina Segovia Petrino is a teacher. Candace uh, is a teacher. And Alexis is a teacher. Um, and in many ways, those of us who are parents are always teachers. We pray for our teachers and our students as we all prepare to begin yet another school year. We pray for the safety of health, for the wise use of masks when necessary, and for social distancing. And we pray for the safety of our teachers as all of this continues to unfold through this pandemic. Keep them and our students in your special care. Hear us, O oh God. The gracious Lord, we pray for uh, the Mounts family on the death of their mother and Jared's grandmother. We pray for your care in their lives that you will upbuild them and hold them uh, and give them the gift of faith and trust uh, in the resurrection. Help this to be a time of growing closer to you and closer to one another in this family. We pray too for our friend Linda McMaster as she, she continues to heal and strengthen at home. Keep her in your care, especially as she has so many life change decisions to make right now. We pray for our uh, daughter-in-law Shannon's grandfather Jim who has cancer of the throat. Um, we pray for him that you might bring those treatments and care in such a way that he is relieved of that cancer and its damage that it's doing to his body. We pray for our neighbor Joe and his family. They're moving to Tyler, Texas, along the border. They've been packing up their home for a week now. Keep them safe in their travels and give them your speed. And we thank you, Lord, for giving our son-in-law, Jeff, your safe travel after having been back to see his family in the Midwest. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious Lord, we pray for Jim and Janet Welsh, um, our Jim Blair's cousins, 
that you'll continue to bring your healing to them. And we pray for Jim's sister, Janet, um, that you'll continue your, your healing in her life. We pray for Jim uh, as he deals with kidney stones and with an eye that is not giving him uh, the kind of light he needs to, to be able to see out of that eye. We pray for that eye's healing. And we pray for the imaging uh, that's going to be done on one of Jim's kidneys uh, on the 28th. Keep Jim in your special care as this all continues to unfold and bring him your care and healing. We pray for Rick and Lori, too, who are preparing to depart to go see Heather and her husband in Hawaii. We pray that the Delta uh, part of this virus that's spreading around now does not create further complications for them about this. And that you'll be with them in their journeys and with them in their joy and reunion time with their family. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious Lord, we pray for Dave and his family, that you'll always keep him in your care, give him courage and strength and your gift of faith. Be it with Dave and his business, that it might grow and strengthen, with Dean and his business as well, that it also might grow and strengthen. We pray for Dave's cousin, Candace, for healing, and for Jerry Morris, that he might continue to heal. Um, we pray for Dave's sister-in-law, Lori, on the death of her husband a couple months ago. Keep Lori in your special care and hold the certainty of the resurrection before her uh, to give her hope and joy in your gifts. We also pray for Ron and Becky, who are going through some difficult times right now after having their bank accounts hacked. Uh, we pray that they'll get that all straightened out. We pray for Alexis Endicott, our sister in Christ. She's been hospitalized uh, for a couple of days over this last week with problems with continual vomiting. Uh, she's home now, has some relief. They've identified the syndrome that this is that may continue to plague her from time to time. But we pray now for her healing and restoration of health. Uh, hear us, O oh God. All these things we pray for in the name of your Son, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Please greet one another with the peace of the Lord appropriately. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive the sacrament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but thine is the kingdom, and thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our communion hymn is 634, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name.
Those in sorrow and peace they will find. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn, which comes prior to the benediction, is on the screen in front of you.